All righty, here we are. Mr. Kev Shilf, welcome. Thanks, bud. Thanks for having me. Very awesome to have you. So it, uh, it kind of worked out really well. You work 10 minutes from where I live, so yeah. it was just uh, a match made in heaven for the, for the interview to happen. Yeah. Um, I heard of you on uh, Hunting Camp Down Under, and since then I kind of reached out, and it, it seemed to make sense because I was after Red Deer in the similar sort of area that you are hunting. Um, and I had a few questions as a beginner, so I hit you up and you've been a wealth of knowledge straight away for me uh, and a, a really good, like, for instance, I, uh, I spooked some deer one day and I thought, I've gone and fucked this, like, I've just ruined my whole weekend and I uh, sent you a message and you're like, no, mate, it's all good, as long as you didn't spook them too bad, go back, see if they're there tomorrow and sure enough, they were, so it kind of saved the bad situation, which is good. And I mean, it's as simple as just getting that little heads up, but when you're starting in the sport or in the, the hobby or the passion, whatever you want to call it, it's, it's, uh, it's handy to have those little things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's good to have a, um, a reference point, Yeah, basically. And um, since doing that podcast with uh, Hunting Camp Down Under and, um, and Craig, it, the response has been overwhelming from beginners, mm-hmm. actually. So good. It's, uh, it's really good to see that our uh, passion or sport or hobby is um alive and thriving yeah yeah Yeah, definitely all right excellent so i mean the big things um i guess that we want to talk about is red deer today and uh it kind of starts from from your background where you grew up on a a red deer farm like you were saying and um it's pretty cool for the skull for those who are watching on youtube the skull in the background um i found that and i sent a photo to kev and he, he kind of told me a bit about it but just now when he came in he was able to tell me so much about just the, just the skull and how old the animal was and everything just based on that which is obviously huge to know because for me i had no idea it's like oh what is this what is that um like I, it just looks cool for me so i'm like oh that's great but um you hear of four five six points on a on an antler and then you never actually take i guess understanding to to what that is from a from a beginner level yeah um and so it's, it's good just to even talk about that now but what i want to get into is more so from the hunting side of you so when you come into a property and there's, you know that there's deer there, but you necessarily haven't found them as such, what are you looking for? What are you going to search for on a, a deer that, oh, sorry, on a property that has deer? Um, well, sign yep. is the first thing. If you can't find the deer, you need to find the sign. So water, mm-hmm. head around your waters, um, look for tracks, head around your sweet spots, your benches, your green gullies, because deer are browsers, they're going to... They're going to sort out the very best food that they can find at any time. They're not grazers like cattle mm-hmm. or sheep. They they browse on just the very best that they can find. So wherever there's a, a wet gully or a green bench, head there, mm-hmm. look for their scat or their crap. Yeah. Um, look for rub trees. You know, look on the fence line for um, deer hair, mm. especially on barbed wire. That's been a big one for me. Yeah, yeah. You'll, you'll find it. Uh, the low points, the crossing areas under fences, mm-hmm. you'll just see the, the deer Just a little hair. tuft of hair. Yeah, yeah, a little tuft of hair stuck on the, on the barbs, yeah. Yeah. Um, look, there's, there's no perfect science to it, but get mm. to know the block mm-hmm. and, and walk, do the miles. Mm. You'll get the smiles, they say. <laughs> so especially water, the, where they can leave their print and leave a mark, mm. that's where you want to look. Yeah, and uh, something that I've come to learn is basically depending on your your farmers will usually rotate their cattle, and where the cattle are, the the deer tend to stick away from. Um, yeah, they don't like cattle. Don't like the cattle at all. Yeah. They don't like cattle. And no. so I'll, I'll find them in a block, and I'll go to that block, and they'll be there multiple times until the cattle are there, and then they're not there anymore. Yeah, yeah. go to where the cattle were. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, it's almost like clockwork. You can see where they're going to be, wherever the cattle are, the deer aren't going to be, and vice versa. Yeah, they don't like competing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and they basically just don't like their company. Mm. Um, I don't know what it is. They're antisocial sort of critters. Yeah. Uh, apart from their Happy own their own, their own, own species. Yeah. But um, they don't like cattle. So in regards to feed, obviously around Australia, we're starting to see some pretty bad droughts. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the difference in two weeks from being up at the property that I go to was huge. Yep. Like a, it, it, everything was green to everything was brown with green tips all of a sudden. Um, and water had dried up. Like it was really quite a fast turnaround. That's just how brutal the sun is. Yep. What are you looking for when you don't have the green valleys as such? What are you chasing? Like uh, do they like Lantana bush? Do they like, is there anything you should look for? Yep, yep. Um, anywhere where there's like green, and it doesn't necessarily need to be green, but fresh growth, mm-hmm. which is basically going to be green. Green, yeah. Um, they like those fresh shoots. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lantana, they only eat that at a certain time of year. Okay. Um, Just when it's got the berries on it? Yeah, look, berries. I've seen berries, but they're not 
ripe berries, they're mm. green berries okay. in their tummy. Yeah. Um, and in my previous podcast, I've, that'll kill cattle. Yeah, okay. But deer cope with it well. I've seen their paunches. Like every time I shoot an animal or I take an animal's life, I always open up their tummy. Yeah. And um, not so much during the rut because I've shot so many and Mm -hmm. and I've I've always got the same stuff in there, basically. Mm -hmm. But outside of the rut, I like to open up their tummy, their paunch, uh, Mm -hmm. which is where it all sits before it goes into the large intestine and all the rest of it. Um, Open it up and see what they're eating at that time of year. So it can be varying and different from area to area but it's only a certain time of the year that you'll find lantana berry in there mm. but um these critters will eat anything they'll yeah, eat okay. eucalyptus leaves they'll eat black wattle they'll eat stuff that you will look at and go mm. wouldn't get anything out of that they wouldn't there's no <laughs> nutritional value in that whatsoever but they make it work for them yeah okay like a goat yeah yeah exactly yeah um how about things like rat tail like the different grasses that cattle won't eat will they eat that stuff do you know i haven't had much to do with rat tail okay um and it's specifically up on that eastern coast kendenga area Area, yeah um it's a real problem up there from what i know yeah um but i've never had anything to do with it so i can't really answer that question mate okay no that's cool it just uh i know that's an issue for the for the cattle farmers i just wasn't sure if it was going to be the same for them like if they would eat it because obviously they're trying to get their hands on anything they can yeah yeah <laughs> uh, so i guess is is there sort of habits you should be looking for with a deer so once you maybe located them what should you, you potentially be looking for like do they do they keep to a routine to some extent um is there i guess signs and things that they do regularly yeah look they are a creature of habit mm-hmm. apart from the rut because mm-hmm. it's it's like game on yeah it's game yeah, exactly. on during the rut so they they just do whatever they need to do during the rut but uh with hinds um outside of the rut and with stags they will have a, a roaming or a home range mm. and they will be like if it's two days apart or one day apart they'll be in the same spot in the same area at the same time hmm. in those intervals yeah so they are very much creatures of habit and they do learn, like if they're picking at an area where there's really good feed mm. and they take all the best stuff, they know that in two days' time, with two days' good sunlight, that it's there's going to be good. regrowth there yeah. and they're going to go back there to get that Yeah, wow. again. Smart little critters. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so how about uh, times of day? Like is there, is there a particular time of day that they're most active? Are they nocturnal animals? Are they going to be around morning, midday, night? Like what are they doing throughout the days? Are we talking rut or just any time? Just any time to start with, and then we might get rut specific. So, morning and afternoon. Mm-hmm. Um, morning's my favourite time. Yeah. Uh, because you run out of shooting light in the afternoon. <laughs> exactly. That's my <laughs> yeah. that's my <laughs> problem. Um, morning's really good. Uh, everything's fresh. Yeah. Usually you've got the night air has settled some sort of moisture on things, mm. um, and you can stalk. Yeah, yeah, you can stalk more easily. Um, but afternoon, three o'clock in Queensland, I call that deer o'clock. They're <laughs> up out of their beds yep. and they're starting to do their thing. So mm-hmm. three until dark, especially that last hour, mm. that's where you will see them mostly active. But they are very active at night. Yeah, um, They sleep during the day. Mm. They'll, they'll just curl up and sleep. I saw um, that, oh, a few questions there, but Casey McCallum was saying that he'll go and spotlight his deer over night time just to get them kind of like firstly find where they're kind of hanging out, but also just to get them used to the vehicles, get them used to you a little bit. And so when they're most active, he'll go out and spotlight them. Is that something you've ever heard for red deer or such? Because I think he's often more fallow. Yeah, look, um, he's a very knowledgeable dude. Okay. Um, <laughs> Probably worthwhile then. Yeah, I've never heard of that. Yeah. But depends on the size of your property and mm-hmm. where you want to drive to and how the ease of access that you, you want. Yeah. I like walking from camp. That's yeah. just me. Fair enough. Um, but they, they do get used to vehicles mm-hmm. growing up on the deer farm. You know, we'd have wild deer come into the pens, mm-hmm. like to the edge of the pen. And you know, the first couple of times you'd drive past them, they'd take off. Yeah. But after a few weeks or a month or two, they just stand just there and watch you yeah. like the like the pen deer. Yeah. So um, they do get used to it, and it's quite clever. Mm. Um, a lot of guys use the electric dog or the spotlight to <laughs> harvest meat. Yeah. But uh, it takes the fun out of it for it me. It definitely does. Yeah. I, uh, funny story, actually. So the first few times I went to the property, I went with my, my cousin's husband. And he's a rifle hunter, 
And so he kind of drives to the different locations and then walks from there. Yeah. And so the first time I went by myself, I, I drove to the different locations and I'd, I'd stop and I'd hop out and go for a walk and come back to the car. And of course, I've driven up to the section where they usually are. And I've hopped down my car and turned around and there's just literally two deer standing up on the, the, like the hill behind me, 200, 400 meters away from me, like within that range. And they're just looking at me, just like, what is this guy on about? And I stood yeah. there, I got my binoculars out. I moved around a fair bit. They didn't, they didn't really care at all. Um, and it wasn't until I kind of made a bit of noise. They're like, oh, yeah, it's time to head off. So it's, uh, it's true. They just definitely get used to the cars. They do, yeah. yeah. I think it might change from vehicle to vehicle because they've got a white ute and the, the um, property owners have white utes. It yep. makes, makes it a lot easier. Yeah, they just associate it with the, the vehicle that they usually see, yeah. Mm. So how about during the rut then? Is it any time of day? that they're up and about or um look being in queensland uh we have to deal with the heat Mm -hmm. um we never used to have to i used to hunt in frosted conditions i was actually (laughs) talking to reuben devos this morning Mm -hmm. and um yeah he said that um geez used to have to get wrapped up to go hunting at this time of year but uh i reckon i could go hunting in my undies (laughs) but uh yeah absolutely um if it's cool, overcast, a little bit drizzly, they'll rut all day. Mm-hmm. As soon as that heat gets up, it knocks the stags up. They do a lot of running, mm-hmm. fighting, chasing, and uh, it, as soon as that temperature rises, they they shut down. They'll lay down and they'll moan. Yeah, but yeah, other than that, it's uh, they wait until deer o'clock. <laughs> and it all starts again. again. And so, uh, obviously, uh, the, the males are on heat. They're going a bit crazy. What happens with the does during that season? Apart from trying to run away, are they trying to keep to their habits and routines? Like, if you know where does hang out, is that a good place to go back to during the rut? Yeah, absolutely. That's, yeah. that's where you want to be. Okay. Where your hinds, uh, where you're used to seeing your hinds yep. or does, um, that's where you want to be because mm-hmm. your stags will come to them. Yeah, cool. Um, and they'll around them up. They'll just keep them in a group. They will fight to get as many as they can in the harem, mm-hmm. but, and then they'll defend that harem yeah. and try and pick up extras as they go. But they don't, they don't push them around much. Okay. If they've got a really good gully or side of a hill bench or something where they, they feel safe, just stay. that's where they'll hold them. Yeah. Yep. And so um, I guess the big question is where do they bed? Like you, you might know that they're on the property, but where do you know... Like do you know or what should you look for in regards to where they would potentially go over night time or where they'd actually go to lay down? Well, during the day when they, when they bed up, it's a spot where they've got breeze, mm-hmm. shade, mm-hmm. and they've got vision. Okay. At least, like, if they can get 360 degrees vision. So not, not necessarily on a ridge. It could be in the middle of a paddock, right? Yeah, it could be in the middle of a paddock. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I've seen them bed down in the weirdest spots, but... <laughs> You can't get near them. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Tricky. Yes. <laughs> Make it very tricky, don't they? Yeah, and you'll see that they'll bed down if there's more than one. They bed head to tail. Oh, wow. So they cover all bases. They're, yeah, they're okay. clever. Yeah, they definitely are. Yeah. Um, in regards to, um, I guess, hunting red deer. Oh, actually, no, before we get into that side of things, what in regards to calling deers during the rut, so calling red deer in, in the rut, yep. are you better to raw or are you ready better to do like doe calls right so um i only raw to locate stags okay so in a distance if you hear something you'd gonna or you do it before you've even heard them i'll do it before i've even heard them yeah uh, many times in queensland here if it's a really warm morning or it's been a warm night mm-hmm. i actually have to get them roaring in the morning and i'll roar multiple times yeah and hind call Mm. Um, just to get them interested and get their blood pumping and get them calling back. <laughs> but once they get going, um, they keep each other going. Yeah, okay. So while they're calling, I'm making my way to, to them. them. Yeah. Yep. And so when you're doing a roar, have you got a, have you got a, a funnel or something like that you're, you're calling into? Like you, you're using anything to project it? Or? So I've had a, um, a bully horn. corn yep. that I've had since I was 19. Uh-huh. Um, I wish I, I've put a notch on that for every deer that I've called in <laughs> because you wouldn't be able to see much horn. But um, they make the best noise, yeah. uh, the best imitation of the sound. Okay. It's also got a lot to do with your, your throat, the your noise vocals. that you make. Yeah. But they, um, the, the extension of the esophagus is what you're after. So a piece mm-hmm. of polypipe, yeah. 
a bit of um, seem like vacuum cleaner pipe. Vacuum cleaner yeah. pipe. A lot of blokes like that. Yep. I don't know why. It's a bit weird. <laughs> um, when I first started calling these things, I used uh, I don't know if you remember the old Orchi bottles. Yeah. Yep. And I got electrical tape and wrapped it around it until I got the right sound. Yeah. Wow. So. And I used that for a couple of years yeah. um, until I got this horn. And and so when you wrapped it, were you then re-listening? Or you, obviously, because you, you grew up with them, so you probably knew the sound a fair bit more yes. than most people. But would you, for instance, maybe look on, on YouTube channels to listen and then try to match it to some extent? or Mate, there wasn't sound? YouTube when I was... No, I know. No, sorry, I, I mean like for now. For, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I meant for a modern day. <laughs> so yeah, look, yeah. There's, there's lots of uh, stuff to watch and learn from. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jack Spinks sent me a link the other day mm-hmm. about these guys that just call deer in in, in New Zealand mm. just so they can film them, wow. which is pretty cool. Yeah, uh, They've got it down pat. Yeah, um, They use a lot of roaring okay. in, in hind calls. Um, but there is lots of stuff on the internet for young guys to learn. <laughs> so Jack Spinks sent you the, the YouTube clip and so people just got down in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, look, it's a big part of their culture over there. Mm. And... Um, it's nothing to walk into uh, a shop or a pub with your camo on over there. Yeah, so bizarre, isn't it? Whereas you do it here and you 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 look like a weirdo. Yeah, people, yeah exactly. People are raising their eyebrows and going, what's this guy? This, guy this guy's a, he's a kook. Unless it's a, a fashion sense, like they've got obviously a lot of camo mm. wear as fashion. The urban camo. Exactly. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's almost highly frowned upon in yes. Australia, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, yep. Unfortunately. Um, and so in regards to if you, once you've located the, where they're at, you start to head towards them, you start to doe call, how frequently are you doe calling? Look, I, I get close to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I can see them and if I want to engage that critter, if I want to take him out of the equation for meat, trophy, cull, mm-hmm. or just if I just want to shoot him, yeah. um, I will hind call. I will get myself in a position where my outline's broken up. Mm-hmm. Not that that really matters since I've been wearing Tusk Camo. That stuff is next level. Actually, since hearing you say that, I bought, I bought the top at least. I haven't got the pants yet, but yeah. Yeah. I got onto it. It's just amazing. They're just getting better and better with what they're, what they're um, developing. Mm. It's actually got insect repellent impregnated in it now. <laughs> it's insane. Crazy, but crazy good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll get close enough if I can see him. I'll hind call if I want to if I want to get closer to him. Mm-hmm. If I can't see him, I'll still hind call because I want to see him. Yeah, okay. And he will give me like as soon as you hind call, he will react. Yeah, he will roar. But if you <laughs> roar, he may roar back. He might not as well. But there's a fifty percent chance that he's just going to slink away and. Mm. And not, so, not so under confrontation. What happens if there's other? And there's usually going to be other hinds around him. What are you doing then? Are you still doing the hind call to get him to come come away from those? Um, yeah. Look, if there's other hinds around him, especially if there's a hot hind like mm-hmm. one that's in full estrus, mm. it's not productive. Okay. Uh, it it can be. Yeah. Uh, depends on if he knows that he's joined her enough times that he doesn't need to worry about her anymore. But. Mm. When they're in full estrus, you just can't get them away from those girls. Mm-hmm. Um, so you just got to be patient. Yeah. Buy your time. Uh, make yourself comfortable. Yeah. Get into position. If you're, if it's depending on the time of the day it is, you got to be aware of your thermals here in Queensland. So mm. uh, once it gets to a certain temperature, all the wind that's heading downhill, if you're on the side of a hill, and let's face it, these things don't live in the flats. Um those winds are going to come back uphill. Mm-hmm. Um, so you get yourself in a position that you can wait it out. He will keep moving around. He'll mosey around his girls, mm. keep them all on check. He'll go around, sniff them all, see if any are coming into estrus. But there'll be an opportunity for you to give him a hind call. Yep. And that may get him away. And if he doesn't, you've got to wait for his girls to get up and move. But mm. it may mean that you need to back out and come back in the afternoon if you're out there hunting in the morning. Or it may mean that you need to come back in the morning if you're hunting him in the afternoon. Mm. But if he's definitely a critter that you're keen on and you want to take him, you just put the time in, yeah. be patient. And so in regards to um, with, your, with your thermals going, 
like what's the best position say you're on the mountain and they're on the mountain with you you're trying to position yourself side onto them to some extent like in line with them on the ridge just above them just above them it's okay. very hard for a deer to look up they can't yeah. do that huh. and they can't do that yeah so elevation is your friend okay if you're under them you got no hope no hope there yep. is no hope they yep. just their their vision downwards is amazing mm-hmm and how about on in like a, a small mound more so? Like if they're more rolling hills rather than like a ridge as yeah. such? Yeah. Depends on if it's timbered or not. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah. If it's only rolling hills, you need to uh, you need to stay, give yourself a bit of distance. Okay. If it's cleared, back out and go and do something else for a while and come back come later. Back. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Mm. Um, and so with the, I guess, oh, let me have a quick look at this. So you, you've got the, the deer that you want to get to, yep. essentially. Um, how long, what's the longest you've waited for when you're going for a stag? Red deer? Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> I've probably been pretty lucky that a couple of hours would be the most. Mm-hmm. Um, fallow deer, it's a different story. Uh yeah five plus yeah okay yeah damn. And so you're just seeing yourself in one location and just sitting to watch yep yeah yep constantly checking the wind with my uh, wind indicator the powder yeah um smoking a bottle whatever you want to call it mm-hmm. um and yeah just get myself comfortable so that i don't have to make many movements so i will pull my pack off so i can just slip my mouthpiece in for a drink yeah all that sort of stuff how about if you're on property that typically swells with the wind where you're located? So in between ridges, for instance, or you've got a maybe like a, a ridge with a mountain with a ridge and you're in the middle of it and that's where yeah. they are as well. What are, you, what are you kind of tending to do? Just get that distance? Head to the ridge okay. because you will get constant wind direction on a ridge. The only mm. reason you've got swells is because you're in, in the middle of it all. Geography that changes the direction of the wind. Yeah. Mm. How about if you don't have glassing sight of them on a ridge? Like, if you're losing sight of the deer, they're commonly going to stay in that one location when they're in, in rut. the middle of the day. Or yeah. yeah. Yeah, look, they'll bed up. Mm-hmm. If, as soon as these girls bed up, he beds up. He goes, yeah. And uh, they're worn out. They're busy. Yeah, okay. They only get four weeks of the year to do this. Yeah. So they're flat out. Mm-hmm. Imagine if you only got four weeks of the year to do that. <laughs> You'd yeah, make exactly. the most of it, right? Yeah. So these guys don't mess around. Mm-hmm. And as soon as they, if everybody's down on their belly, they do the same. Mm. Just, you just need to get yourself in a position where you just can keep checking. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're moving around. If they can't direct line of sight see you, you're fine. you'll be fine. How, is it always April? Like, does it, like I've heard people talking about the rut potentially changing with the seasons changing, with the weather changing. Uh, is it based on weather or is it based on something else? It's based on the solstice, the length of days. Okay, yeah. Um, that's why they usually rut on Easter. Mm-hmm unfortunately yeah for them um but i have hunted them on the 14th of march yeah rutting in queensland yeah full-blown roar i have been out in june and i've heard them roaring far out okay but that is all to do with the hind cycle yeah okay you'll have girls that'll come in early or girls that'll come in late Mm -hmm. but for the main part 99 percent april yeah yeah and in regards to the the deer that you see at your property all all the other time of the year, are they always are they going to stay there or do they go elsewhere to rut? I don't see many. Um, I don't see many stags on the properties that I hunt. Uh-huh. Um, one particular property next door holds the stags during the off season. Yeah, but they come to where I hunt because mm-hmm. that's where the does are. Because we hold the girls. Yeah. Um, and in the same stags, they will hunt in the very, very close to the same area every year, mm-hmm. depending on where the girls are, of course. But um, just last year, I took a client to a double four with a downward facing baton on his right side. Mm-hmm. And I had watched him for the last three or four years and um, he didn't get any better than mm-hmm. a double four. And uh, decided to take him out of the breeding cycle. cycle yeah. But he had been he had rutted in the same gully 
the same bench for those four years. Yeah. Creatures of so, habit. Exactly, yeah. Um, and I think I mentioned on the, on the previous podcast, um, these guys, the theory is that they go back to where they were born mm-hmm. to grow their velvet because well, yeah. that's where their mum is. Yeah, okay. And they move away from there. Well, that's where their mum and their sisters are. Yeah, that's typical of elks too, isn't it? I don't know. I think I think I heard that previously. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and then they move away from there to rut. Okay. So they're not, you know, going in with that same. Just going in line breeding. Yeah. Is a nice way to put it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and I mean, based on on antlers, you can kind of tell on how how strong a breed is, right? Or how good the bloodline is. The bloodline, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you can also tell by the shape of the stag, like. Mm-hmm. I've shot stags that are smaller in body size than hinds. Okay. You know, something's yeah. not right with that critter. Mm. When you can you can pick up a um, a freshly killed stag and uh, he's not gutted or anything, you can pick him up off the ground with his ears and his tail. Yeah. So. Far out. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So something's not right there. No, exactly. In regards to eating animals, uh, eating eating red deer in particular, does it matter... Like, what's the best eating of a red deer? Is it does? Is it yearlings? Is it uh, an old mature stag? What What do you? Uh, it might be personal preference. I'm not sure, but well, it is. Um, a lot of guys don't, or a lot of people don't like the rank taste or the gamey taste of an older mm-hmm. stag. Um, I'm one of those. Yep. I'm not particularly fussed on it, mm-hmm. even with my German background. Still doesn't stick through. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's not the most pleasurable dining experience. Yeah, um, but I find at this time of year, last year's fawns, so your spikers mm-hmm. and your yearling, your yearling hinds that are coming through. Yeah, they're, they're tasty best. little buggers. Yeah. yeah, they're really good. And so, when would you be going for them? They're not, not like you wouldn't necessarily be going for them in the rut. That's more like time no. for for the trophies, right? Yep. So December through to the rut, mm-hmm. that's prime time, even though it's really hard to keep the meat fresh because it's a really hot time of year up mm. here in Queensland. The meat's good. Mm. The meat's okay. really good. Even hinds before they, they cycle. But you usually, you've got to remember that if you take a hind out between December and April, that she's going to have a fawn. Mm. And if another hind doesn't surrogate that fawn, you've taken two, two out. Lives. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I guess that's where, like in Australia, we don't have a tag system. We don't have a system in regards to looking after the deer and the deer species as such. Ethically for us, what is the best thing for us to do as hunters? Uh, When it comes to culling these animals, is there certain things we should be looking out for? So obviously that's one thing is if you're going to take a hind, you're potentially taking the fawn as well. Yeah. Is that going to make a big difference to numbers? Look, I'm a great believer that every five years... Every hunter should be just solely concentrating on taking females mm-hmm. out of the out of the herd. Yeah. So four years hunt hunt the boys, and in your fifth year, you shoot as many females as you can just to keep that bloodline fresh. Yeah. You know what I mean? It it's there's no point in just continually taking out the male of a species and mm-hmm. leaving the same females there. Always there. You're just always going to have the same results. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. So every five years, I'll still do it now. Like I, if I'm out uh, particularly just chasing meat, mm-hmm. if I look at the, the fawn and I look at the, the hind and I think, mm, she's in pretty good nick, mm-hmm. even though she's got a fawn. If I think the fawn is old enough that will survive on its own, yeah. Go for um, it. I'll slip an arrow through a through hind. I've got no, no misconceptions that no. there's plenty of animals out there and I'm doing a good thing for the genetics in the, in mm-hmm. the area. Yeah. And when it comes to genetics and culling, um, like if you see a, a, a stag that's in potentially a bad way, is it worthwhile just getting rid of them? As in antler growth? Or yeah, I guess you could base on antler, antler growth, but also if it's just a, a mangy looking creature to some extent. Like. Look, we, um, in the last 10 years in Queensland here, we're experiencing a lot of mange on our red stags mm-hmm. um you won't particularly find it in those coastal areas but inland in the um in the uh headwaters of the brisbane river and the brisbane valley mm. we get a lot of ticks okay 
and they get mange. This it's horrible stuff. It looks like a really bad case of dandruff, and their capes are absolutely destroyed. Yeah. Um, but culling. A lot of people say that culling. Um, you know, you shoot it just because you want to shoot it. Well, I can honestly say that. I try and make a very sound decision on whether that animal should be in the um, in the genetic pool mm-hmm. because I've got five sons, mate. I want them to be able yeah, to shoot yeah, a exactly. trophy someday. Yeah. So um, I take a lot of things into consideration if I'm thinking that it's a cull head. Yeah. If it's older than two and a half, so a first head past the spike, mm-hmm. and it hasn't got more than four points... Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I think about it. If it hasn't got more than four points, um, as a you know, as a as a general rule, you need to seriously try and evaluate the age of that animal. Mm-hmm. If it's got a, th- a a two by two, that's a first head past the spike. Yeah. Now, just for example, that thing there is a second head past the spiky. Fire out. And uh, that's that's what genetics does can do and so you've got well because i learned tonight seven on one side because you can get a ring around that little nub on yep. the left and then five that's called a basal snag yep okay and then you've got yeah five on the other side yeah which is second year yep oh th- Sorry, that's uh th- that's a three, three and a year. half year yep. old yeah so second head past the spiky <laughs> so if you see any spikers a lot of people say oh shoot spikers for me that's mm-hmm. cool but if they're exceptionally long spikes mm-hmm. Or if they've got an extra point on top or some cool shit happening down around <laughs> where they grow from the pedicle, yep. don't kill them. Yeah, they're going okay. to be your, your unique bloodline. trophies yep. of the future. Mm. But if they're just like, oh, it's got six-inch spikes, eh, go for your life. Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. It's, and if they've got little buttons, especially like buttons are very common with fallow deer, mm-hmm. Red spikers have got no business having buttons on their head for spikes. <laughs> yeah. No, they should be Big. a foot long minimum. Okay. And, um, you know, forks on top or... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's very interesting. It's, it's, I guess it's good to know because if you're going out for your first run, which I am this year, it's kind of like, well, what, what should I be looking for? And if it comes to it, like I'm, I'm going to have to be a weekend warrior this year. I can't go out and do a week long at all unfortunately yeah. like I've got the whole of Easter over there which is four or five days yeah. which is nice and I've got a few weekends teed up as well but it's kind of like it, if it comes to it and you have to make the decision <laughs> it's like what do you go for yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 definitely so how about gear when it comes to hunting uh, so obviously talking archery as a straight piece like what are we looking for for minimum weight in an arrow uh, is there a minimum poundage you should be looking for as well on your bow yeah, okay. Um, this is all personal preference, okay. basically. Um, I shoot 73-pound Bowtech Realm X. Yep. Um, I've got a 29-inch draw. Mm-hmm. So with that draw length and that poundage, 480-grain arrow and broadhead combination, so including the broadhead, 480 yep. grains, that gives me optimum speed mm-hmm. and kinetic energy. Yeah. So you've got a flat shooting arrow and you've got penetration. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the bad boy that's on the front that's going to do all the damage. So you've got to pick a sturdy broadhead. Yeah, definitely. So um, as far as bows go, I can can talk shit about other brands, mate. Um, I used to be Matthews. I'm now Bowtech. Um, it's a personal preference. Yep. Some people drive Ford, some people <laughs> drive Toyota. Uh-huh. But, you know, it's just a personal thing. Whatever works for you, whatever you enjoy shooting, whatever fits you well, yep. whatever you get the best performance out of. And are you, are you changing your setup throughout the year, like with your arrow setup at all? Or are you keeping it the same all no, year round? You I, don't even shoot, I don't even shoot field tips, mate. Or even my practice, yep. I'm using broadheads because I'm sure, not a target got, shooter. Yeah. The only thing I use a target for is to stop my broadheads getting destroyed. Yeah. And knowing that I'm grouping all right, I take I take the target with me every time I go hunting because mm-hmm. as soon as I get out of the vehicle, I put the target out. Yeah. Three shots. Yep, I'm happy. I'm yep. happy that I'm not going to injure an animal. Mm. And uh, touch wood, I haven't done that yet. Yeah. Um, and off I go. Mm. But anything that you, any 
setup that you're going to hunt with, you need to make sure that you have used it in every sort of hunting scenario, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, you've got to sort of uh, give you put yourself in a position like on your knees, sitting mm-hmm. flat sitting on your down. ass, yeah. anything that you can think of that you may be put into in the field, mm-hmm. you practice with your bow in those positions, yeah. yeah. And it's not that likely that you're going to be like, at least talking from my experience and the situations I've got into, it's not that often you can be standing. Yeah. <laughs> like unless you've got trees all around you, yeah. it's, uh, it's not a common thing that you'll get into the field potentially and be able to stand. So Correct. Yeah. Correct. But I mean, there's a big lesson in what you just talked about in hopping out of the car once you get to the location actually shooting. Um, I didn't do this for a long time and I've unfortunately injured a few pigs. So, yeah. I mean, I just took the shot and I'm like, that was that should be a perfect shot and they just got away i saw the i saw the like i had a a light knock in there yep. and it just saw it run along and just kept running i'm like it's gonna fall off and fall over any moment soon just kept going kept going and then all of a sudden my arrow fell out and the pig just lived i blood tracked it as far as i could and it was little drops the whole way yeah um but yeah it turned out that whenever i had my broadheads on it would shoot 50 centimeters to the left oh yeah which is huge um and talking to a few different people jake um i guess roski in, in particular he said that if your bow is perfectly tuned, that shouldn't happen. Correct. However, when I put it on with a different broadhead, my new setup, it works completely perfectly. So I wonder, is it like, I mean, two blade compared to three blade, is that going to make a big difference in, in the flight of the arrow? Um, look, I'm not the most technical bloke to talk to. Uh-huh. Jake's your man there, okay. or Ian Summers. Yep. Um, some broadheads just don't fly well. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have your, with your two blade, I like having them straight up and down. Okay. Vertical on the on the on the arrow rest. Yep. Um, that gives you more of a chance, especially with the the speeds that we can shoot at, mm. at now. Mm-hmm. Um, three blades, multiple blades. Yeah, they they're pretty cool because you don't need to worry about that because yep. it's there. But um, yeah, it, it can make a difference. Yeah, it absolutely can. With it being straight up and down, I would have thought that if there was wind, it would affect it. To some yeah, extent. well, it's turning. Okay. But it's when it initially takes off is the theory. Yep. It's like a paper aeroplane. Yeah, okay. Possible. I yep. don't know. Yep. Not the most technical no, bloke in the cool. world. That's good to know. But I kill critters. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You're successful in it, so <laughs> it's proven. <laughs> um, how about going for sheds? When's the best time? Like, if, for instance, you want to get a few sheds after after the rutting season, when's the best time to go looking in the, in the paddocks? Look, I've never targeted sheds. Okay. Never. Do you know well, when they knock them off just based on... Previous. So it depends on age. Yep. So the older they are, the earlier they'll drop, mm-hmm. and then the more quickly they'll they'll grow. They'll start yeah. their growing phase. Okay. So um, if you're out there around October, mm-hmm. yeah, most things should be on the ground by then. Okay. October. And yeah. so you talked about the, and this was before we started recording. You talked about the antlers growing within a hundred days. Yes. Um, so when is that period of life for them? Is so. You've got to think that their rut's happening in April. Mm-hmm. 100 days is roughly three months, Yeah, a bit more. So if you backtrack it, they're all rubbing, pretty much rubbing now. Okay. Um, but if you backtrack to the start of November or the start of October, mm-hmm. that's when the growing it's phase growing. is, start yep. of October through to so I saw, February. I saw multiple stags in january and they were all they all looked like they'd finished growing is that typical yeah it depends on their age okay so they the older they are they they cast early yeah and once they've cast they just start growing now the younger stags you'll see them in velvet right up to february mm-hmm. yeah but those older stags like they will start rubbing in january okay yeah. so that's a good time like when you're preparing on a property for for rut season you start looking in January for places they're they're rubbing and and I oh, look I don't <laughs> yeah I just go out scouting okay basically yeah if I come across something like that you know cool yeah yeah oh look there's a rub that's about a week old he's got some age on him if yeah, that's okay. in the first week of January you know what I mean but not many blokes will get out there in January because it's so bloody hot <laughs> up here Pussies. Yeah. but it it is a very rewarding time of the year yeah. Um, the cast antlers are fresh. Always look along your fence line for cast antlers when they go under the fence. Oh. But also when they jump over, the jerk of them landing, Can they'll just pop off. <laughs> there you go. And you'll find pairs on fence just lines. Right there. Yep. Yep. 
dams as well when they put their head down to have a drink in, in a water hole yeah, they'll cool just thing. drop in yeah far out mm. but uh it's definitely kind of like whenever i get to the property it's definitely the first place i go to is the dams just yep. to check because it seems like or in particular while it's hot it seems to be the best in my thought pattern it's like well if i'm thirsty i'm hot they're probably gonna be the same thing yeah and uh many times i've seen them in the in the water Yes. And they're just playing around in the water. They yep. uh, kind of fiddle around with each other. It's quite funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah especially the young ones. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they love it. They they just go crazy in soft dirt mm-hmm. and in water. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so you're actually a butcher by trade. When it comes to knives and sharpening and butchering an animal, uh, is there particular, like, it, does the quality of knife matter? I guess. Yes. Like, should, you, should you be buying buying the best knife you can? I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> um, look, I've had the same knife um, in my pack for, it's a bit embarrassing. It was bought for me for my 21st birthday. Wow. I turned 43 in two weeks' times. Mm-hmm. So I've got still got the same knife. It's a buck. It's a generic buck skinner, yep. which was made in the US back when I got it. They're not made in the US anymore. Okay. I've been very fortunate that... Um, Espostal Blades, or Espostal mm-hmm. is the way you pronounce it. Um, he said, hey, Kev, I want to make you a couple of knives. Yeah, well. Um, one for your wife and one for yourself, because my wife's into hunting as well. God cool. bless her. And, um, yeah, um, he just has involved me the whole way. Now, mm. um, he's made me two spectacular knives, and I wish the bloody postman would hurry up, because <laughs> he posted them yesterday. Yeah. But... Uh, the quality of blade will make sure that you've got a sharp knife mm-hmm. for the duration of your hunting period yeah. instead of having to put that damn thing on a stone mm-hmm. every day. Yeah. Um, the steel is important. The quality of the steel, the ergonomics of the handle, the safety of the handle. It's got. You got to make sure it's got a stop on it. Yeah. Because when you're out in the field, if you slip, you get hand slip over a blade. Mm. Gone. It's not pretty, especially no. if you know how to sharpen a knife. Yeah. Um, but not only do you need a good knife, you need a good steel mm-hmm. to keep that to blade keep it sharp. sharp. Yep. It doesn't keep it sharp, it just keeps straightening your edge. Yeah. But you also need that steel for your broadheads. Mm. Yeah. Makes sense. So, mate, knives, knives are one of my favourite things in the world. Yeah. I'm not only a fully qualified butcher, but I'm also a slaughterman and a boner. Uh-huh. It's which makes my job very easy in the field. <laughs> yeah, the field yes, I can um, break down a, a deer really quickly, so it's yeah. it's good, good fun. <laughs> um, but that the quality of that blade means the ease of your job. Mm-hmm. You're using shit steel. As soon as you cut through hide, you're it's on the st- you're on the steel. Yeah, and if you're if you hit a tooth, that's a stone job. Yeah, okay. Right. Um, and always, if I can give anybody a hot tip that's starting out, always go through from the flesh side through your hide. Don't cut down through the hair. Not only will you ruin your cape or your skin, yeah. you just ruin your knife okay. as well. Hair, nothing bluntens a blade more than hair. hair and dirt. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And then also, like, is it less, I guess like you'd get less hair around the place too wouldn't you then that's right yeah if you cut from the flesh side out Mm -hmm. the hair just parts it doesn't Mm -hmm. get cut Mm -hmm. um yeah and and your carcass is a lot cleaner yeah yeah that's very interesting i I, uh we so the guy that i was saying that we went out with previously my, my cousin's husband he shot two deer and we we skinned them and it took him I'd never seen it or done it before, so I was just more so observing than, than participating. Uh, and it took him a good, good part of three, four hours. Holy shit. Yeah, I know. So obviously, obviously, it must be because it, was first, well, it wasn't even his first time. I don't know. It just took him a long time. And I feel like that was, uh, I think feel like he was being pedantic with it. Yeah. And that it was over uh, maybe longer than what it should have been. Like. <laughs> yeah. What, how long do you think it should kind of take? Like, once you get the hang of it. Oh, look, for beginners, I would, no doubt, it would take over an hour to skin mm-hmm. to skin one. Um, for me, it takes me 10 to 15 minutes. And are you hanging them or are you doing this on the ground? So I do all the opening cuts on the hide on the ground. Uh-huh. Then I hang them up. Yep. And then I strip them down and I punch off most of my pelts. Mm-hmm. 
Um, you won't do that with an animal like a buffalo or a cow no. or anything. But um, there's a lot of different pointers. If you look up skinning deer on the on the net, you'll see that guys use four wheelers with a with a <laughs> golf ball yep. and all that. As long as they've hung them, yep. that Achilles tendon is extremely Super strong. Strong, yeah. You do all your opening cuts and and pull it down a little bit, then you just hook that bad boy up to uh, a vehicle of any shape or size. Yeah. And just very gently just pull it. But um, I am very pedantic. I'm a perfectionist. Yeah. That's just my nature. And I like leaving every bit of flesh on the animal. Mm -hmm. And I like my hides to be clean. And and my taxidermists love my hides because they're so pristine. Mm -hmm. Um, That you should look at a deer after you've taken the skin off of it. And it looks like a zebra across the back. That's getting all the all the subcutaneous muscle that is in the salvage and everything, it's all left in situ. So Yeah, wow. Yeah. They should look silver with some red stripes, yeah, basically. Okay. Um yeah. And so once like are you taxidermy most of your hides once you've got them or No, look, red deer hides don't make the best rugs. Okay. <laughs> they get messy. Yeah. Uh, they're actually like a quill. Yeah, okay. They're hollow. Uh so a bristle quill. Yeah. Um but fallow deer, mm. oh, I love fallow deer rugs. Yeah, I've got a fallow deer rug. We've got it, given it for our uh, wedding. Oh, yeah, right. a great gift. It's probably nice. one of my favorite gifts from our wedding. I was like, that's incredible. Yeah, fallow, chittle, yeah. beautiful. Yeah, Absolutely definitely. beautiful. So. And so in regards to Brisbane Valley, uh, and I mean, does, where does the Brisbane Valley go to? Like is, is Gympie still counted as part of the Brisbane Valley? Or I not think quite? it's more Mary Valley okay. up that way. Yeah. Um, Brisbane Valley sort of gets pulled up, um, up around that. Jimna sort of uh, Nanango area there yeah you know uh, Menambar area yeah and so how low can we see deer how close to Brisbane do you see deer mate I could take you for a five minute drive and show you deer in the middle of Brisbane here no way just in some of the reserves we've got around the place yeah isn't it insane like I'll, I'll talk to people about um, deer hunting and saying I go out on the weekend like oh I'm going out hunting this weekend I'm going to go check out some deer and they're like we've got deer here <laughs> like, mate there's deer around Brisbane I didn't know they were that close like so there's that reserve literally just there mm-hmm. uh, the Richmond Road Reserve I think it's called Would, like is, is that the sort of space you'd find them or? oh yeah that's um, yeah just go that way a little bit yeah because <laughs> I mean around um, so Murray for instance I've seen foxes plenty yep foxes and even around uh, Morningside there's foxes all through where the where the creek is. Yes. And so I'll, I'll take my dog down to the, the school, which is right on the creek. And I swear I'm going to see a fox one day. I'm waiting for it to yep. come out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's so bizarre. So they're, they're right in the suburbia. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And they're not far. You head west and there's a lot of escapees from floods on the Brisbane River. And mm-hmm. there's some really good uh, rooster and fallow mm-hmm. around Brisbane. Okay. And but so... It's, you just can't get access to get them and, no, the, and exactly. then the council get onto them yep. they become a bother a safety hazard mm. they sleep on the roads and all that sort of stuff and you know they get poisoned or shot out yeah yeah. in regards to the the petition that's gone around recently did you see that the Queensland petition to get yeah uh, I signed it uh, yeah, yeah same I got on it um, what do you think the, the steps from here are like do you see it going forward do you see anything happening in, in council or um Look, let's not just say council and government in general yep. Yep. in Queensland. So the biggest gig is is that, you know, we've got these beautiful deer on our Queensland uh, coat of arms mm-hmm. and they've earmarked them as a feral pest, Yeah, which isn't cool. No. Um, and so that's the way people are treating them. Mm. When they're a, um, they're a valuable resource. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, they increase revenue in remote towns at mm-hmm. a certain time of year. They're a very valuable source of protein, mm-hmm. um, which can also grow um, revenue for businesses such as archery shops, shooting, yeah. like rifle establishments, all that. It's also a form of recreation mm-hmm. and education for our young people. Yeah. But if we don't have people joining what we do if we don't get actively um, involved in educating people to make this easy Mm. and if we don't have you know the government jump on board to give access like I've been in some places where I shouldn't be Mm -hmm. that is government land yeah 
like lease land, for instance. Yeah, yeah. let's call it lease land. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've seen hundreds of head of yep. deer in like a three or four hundred acre block. Yeah, wow. Like hundreds. Mm -hmm. And um, these, these critters are in there and they're eating the heads out of pine trees and all the rest of it. Just doing what they do. Yeah. They're not being malicious. No, exactly. They're just surviving. Yeah. But if we don't have the government get on board to make that stuff accessible mm. to the average bloke and if they, you know, put a ballot out there. Mm. Do what America does. Do what Victoria does. Do what New South Wales does. Exactly. You know, <laughs> use it. Yeah, I know. Queensland's the greatest state in Australia. Honestly, it is. Mm. I've lived in a lot of states in Australia. Queensland's the greatest state in Australia, but they've got this wrong. Yeah. And uh, to hold back from giving um, honest, hardworking people the access to the land that we pay to with our taxes Keep. to upkeep, yeah. I think it's so wrong. And, mm. and to deny us of... Um, like, they've, they've got recreational fishing licences. Yeah. Why not make it? And they, they spend all this money stocking impoundments and all the rest. Of it. It's great. I love fishing. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. It's, I think that's wonderful. Yeah. But why not use the resource that's already that's there? Got. So I guess from, from a hunter's perspective, what, what can we do better? Um, don't be so narrow-minded. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my advice to a lot of people out there. Yeah. Um, if somebody says to you, hey, I want some help on learning how to hunt mm. and they're a trustworthy person that's good, you help them. Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of blokes are too shut down. Yeah. Secretive. Um, look, what I, what the information that I give, it's only as good as you using it in the right um, situation. Exactly, yeah. And that's all part of the learning. But mm. you're going to have a lot more success by walking out there and utilising a hind call mm. than going out and ripping out a raw and scaring your first deer away and then just turning around and saying, well, well that was crap, I'm not doing that again. I'll just walk five kilometres to do that. Yep. No, no thanks, I'm not yep. doing that. So um, for the guys that are serious, uh, and you can tell who's serious and who's not, mm -hmm. Give them the time of day. Yeah. Give them the common courtesy and the respect of educating them and pointing them in the right direction. You don't need to tell them where you go hunting. No, exactly. But don't give them give some pointers secrets. on trying to get some access. Yeah. Um, point them in the right direction of sound advice for their archery gear or their hunting gear. Mm -hmm. um, don't set them up to fail because when they fail... That's when they become cowboys. Give their bow, their bow away or they go into the places they shouldn't be, right? Oh, look, I, I thought I was a hunter until I picked up a bow, honestly. Yep. Um, and I've got nothing against rifle shooters no. at all. No. I used to be one for years, decades. But um, it's just the next level. Mm. It's um, Rifles certainly have their part, especially in meat harvesting and yep. all the rest of it. And rifles are fun, man. You get yeah, to blow exactly. shit up, right? Yeah, They're awesome. Uh, my, my wife loves rifles. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I just, there's something more satisfying out of archery for me. Mm. Uh, a, lot of guys, a lot of guys I hunt with still, uh, they pick up the bang stick, I yep. call them, <laughs> and um, they might go around the bush and make a hell of a lot of noise where I can slip in, get the job done, slip out. Yep. Nothing knows that I've been there. Mm. So that's the way I like it. So. I, uh, I often say that if I was a rifle hunter, I'd be very successful because <laughs> I'm a terrible bow hunter, that's for sure. <laughs> it's, uh, and it's crazy, right? Because it's just how close you need to get. It's, yeah. uh, the, the, the fun in it has been the stalking. So yes. far, like, oh, obviously everything that leads up to that as well, but that's been the hardest thing and the, the biggest thing I think that keeps me going back as well because yep. it's like uh, this challenge the that challenge. I just haven't overcome yet, I'm going to keep going until I freaking do. And then there'll always something, be something bigger and better to go on to, I'm sure. Yeah, but as soon as you get it done, you're just like, hey, I want more of that. Yeah. Because the feeling you get and the the self-worth that you get out of it, mm -hmm. of the success and all the work that has led to that moment mm. is very overwhelming. I bet. I, I'd said, I've said it plenty, plenty of times, I swear I'm going to cry the first time I get a deer. Like, <laughs> If you don't get emotional when you take the life of another critter, mm. you've, got no, you, you've got no right being a hunter. Yeah. There, you've got to have respect for that animal. Mm. And um, part of that respect is the work that you put in 
to being able to put yourself in the position to take its life yeah. and then having enough respect for that animal to take that life ethically, yeah. cleanly and uh, knowing that you've done the job. If you injure that animal, you need to do everything that you possibly can mm-hmm. to get it to hunt it down. Yeah. yeah. So in regards to, I guess, going on to ethical shots then, what do you think an ethical shot is? Like what, what should you, or what do you try to keep your shots within? Oh, geez. There's a little... There's called a magic triangle on a deer. <laughs> okay. So from the back of the, the foreleg, let's just say they're standing broadside on. Yep. Perfectly, both sets of legs are in line. Mm-hmm. Back of the foreleg, the front legs. Yep. Follow that line up. And then one third body mass. Yep. That's about the ticker mm-hmm. or the heart or maybe even a little bit lower than one third. Mm-hmm. But... A very large majority of the time, unless your bow is super silent, they're going to jump the string. Yeah. And they'll drop. So you need to aim for the heart. And that way, if they drop, if you're very good or very lucky, you're going to double lung lung them. Yeah. If they have absolutely no idea that you're there and they're completely relaxed or they're lying down, you want to go for a lung shot, you go for a lung shot. But that there's a triangle there that goes from the point of their... their uh, so you've got the shoulder blade, then the humerus. Mm-hmm. The humerus kicks forward. Yep. Follow that line up from the back of the leg to where the shoulder blade comes all the way back and there's just an open square of soft um, deadliness if you get an <laughs> arrow through there. Um, front on shots, I'm not a great not fan great. of. No. Um, although I have my really big fella at home, I took him front on. Mm-hmm. Um, very fortunate that that worked out very well. Yep. Um, In that moment, what were you thinking during that front shot? Was it be like, yeah, take us through it? What happened? Well, he had just um, he just propped, and his no his nostrils flared. I was already at full draw, mm-hmm. and um, and I've just looked at him and I thought, yeah, he's thirty, and I've settled my thirty pin on him, and I watched his nostrils flare out. He just got like a a brief whiff of us yeah and i thought oh well this is the only shot i'm gonna have and there's there's an opening now because i'm a butcher and slaughterman and boner i've got the you know i've got the uh, privilege i suppose or the knowledge to know where that that heart's lying and i slipped it straight through it went straight through his heart and straight out the back end of him Mm -hmm. full front on shot yeah slightly quartering on very slightly. Yeah. But there's a crease there that it's just soft and it's above the brisket and it's on the neckline and it just slips straight through there. Mm. Um, like I said, and I'm not a very technical person, but my bow was shooting straight and I pulled off a decent shot. So yeah. he ran, uh, you know, 70, 80 metres and ripped a few trees out on the way and, and dropped stone dead. Mm-hmm. Didn't move again. Um, but the quartering away shot, I like... You just got to... What are, what's important for guys, learn the anatomy yep. and don't worry about where you're going to hit them, but worry about where the arrow is going to come out on the other side. Uh, that's interesting. Okay. It's the exit point that's important. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you think, oh, you know, I've got to hit him there. He's quartering away. Got to hit him there, but that's a gut shot. <laughs> Gut's not going to stop an arrow. No. It's where that arrow is going to come out. If So if you're slipping it in behind, quartering away, you're slipping it in behind that last rib. Mm-hmm or a little bit further back, you want it to come out on the point of the shoulder on the opposite on the side. side. Yeah. And then the, in between, what have we got? Lungs and heart. We've got lungs and heart. Yeah. So double lung shot, very effective. Uh-huh. Heart shots, they seem to make a bit more ground on a heart shot. <laughs> but lung shot, they can't do anything without air. Yeah. Um, very effective. Yeah. And so typically once you've taken a good shot, how long should it take a deer to drop? Oh, well, depends on how alert they are, Yeah. how much adrenaline they've got. And if you've shot a deer and he's just been fighting, he's pumped up. Mm. So, so you give him going. some time. Yeah. Um, one thing again, it's very important <laughs> virtue is patience. Yeah. Bow hunting. Yeah. Slip your shot through. If you're confident with your shot, sit, and wait. sit down and roll the smoke. Yeah. Do whatever you want to do. Yeah. Jesus. Have a feed. <laughs> um, give him a bit of time. But if you... In open country, you can watch them run and you'll watch them drop over. Yeah. Jeez, sorry. Loud, right? <laughs> yeah, it just goes and goes. Yeah. 
Okay, excellent. Well, um, mate, I think that's a that's a good wrap. That's a good bloody episode. I mean, we've covered a lot, and I feel like you've geared everyone up. Like, uh, hopefully, we we covered a few insights that you didn't get to cover on the other podcast you got to do. I think uh, yeah, I would strongly recommend if if people haven't heard that to jump across and listen to that because I I found it super insightful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'd just say thank you for taking the time, mate. I really appreciate it, and I'm sure the listeners will as well. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, mate. I just love talking deer. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's what I know. But uh, yeah, anybody that wants to reach out, um, I'm sure that when you, I'll put some tags and stuff. But what's the best place? Is Instagram the best place for you? Yeah, I don't do much on Facebook. There's too mm-hmm. much rubbish on there. Yeah, uh, too many opinions. Yeah, um, but Instagram's Kev underscore Shelf. Um, yeah, that'll find me. So, Unreal. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks, bud.